Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I'm delighted to welcome back Dr. James Tabor. You are most welcome, sir. Thank you, Paul. It's always good to be with you. For those who don't know, James uh, retired last year as a full professor from the Department of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte in the U.S., where he taught Christian origins and ancient Judaism for 33 years. Among James's publications include over 50 published articles, as well as nine academic books. And he's popular. Uh, pop, uh, he's a popular public lecturer, often consulted by uh, the national and international media. For example, Time, Newsweek, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street, and many others. James has a professional blog uh, that deals with biblical studies, worth looking at, um, as well as a popular YouTube channel, which is really uh, really going strong at the moment, I've noticed, James Table Videos. And I will link to these in the description below, definitely worth checking them out. Now, today, uh, we will continue discussing uh, the fascinating question, did Jesus' first followers think that he was God? Now, most Christians, I suspect, think they did. But what does the earliest historical evidence tell us? This video is the second part of a two part series exploring the subject. And I'll link to the first part if you've not seen it below. So over to you, sir. Thank you, Paul. It's always great to talk to you in depth. I like to dig into these things with your people. So uh, I'm going to hold this up. Uh, we're going to put a link in the description oh. where everyone can have this. It's a nine or 10 pages. And let me tell you what this is. Whenever we began to study early Christianity uh, or the Jesus movement, the John the Baptist, Jesus, James movement is what I prefer to call it, that becomes something called Christianity in the second, third, fourth, fifth centuries. We have a new religion. But if we go back to the early days, we're talking about an apocalyptic messianic movement within Judaism. And I think we can successfully say, and this would be true of all of the movements that we know about from that late second temple period up to 70 CE when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, none of them ever even dreamed that the Messiah would be God or divine or worthy of worship. Messiah by definition means one whom God has anointed or chosen or commissioned. <clears throat> it's very close to prophet, but it's particularly referring to a royal figure, either a priest or a king. So uh, I just wanted to start with that. So what we have to do if we're going to be scientific and take a proper historical view of things is to ask what is the earliest evidence? And that would be true with any endeavor, I'm a historian of religions, happens that I study the Jesus movement. But you start with sources. What do we know? How do we know it? How do we know what we know? And you don't start in the fifth century or the fourth or the third or the second. I'm not saying there couldn't be any later material, but if we can get something early, we want to do it. And what I'm waving here is the earliest record we have of Jesus. Now, where did I get this? Yep. It's almost as good as finding a Dead Sea Scroll or something like that, although it was found actually in the pages of a standard Christian Bible. Mm. Here is uh, my personal Bible, the RSV. I know you usually yeah, have one. There you go. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. So it's real simple, really. If you take our three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, something that was noticed by German scholars way over a hundred years ago, is that Mark wrote first, we think, hmm. and then Matthew and Luke use Mark as the basic narrative source. And that's why when you read these gospels, you get the impression people start with Matthew because it's first. It's actually later than Mark. And then they get to Mark, and it sounds like, well, I've already read this. Is, what is this, sort of a shortened, like, yeah. synopsis of Matthew? And it's far from that. It's actually the source of Matthew's narrative. Mm. But what scholars began to notice was that if you then take Matthew and Luke, they're primarily getting their narrative material from Mark, 
but then they have a, a collection of about, um, they're primarily getting their narrative material from Mark, the story. Yeah. But they have a collection, and that's what this document is, of 50, we call them pericopes, not verses, but little snippets. Some are one verse, some are five or six verses, little stories. Yeah. And it's almost all what Christians call red letter material. That is, if we printed this out, the words of Jesus, it would be almost all red. Yeah. You know, it might say, and Jesus said, and then red, 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 red. In some Bibles, they used to do that. So these are, it's a collection of the sayings of Jesus. And the way you get it is actually amazingly simple. Uh, it would take a lot of work to do it yourself, but we're going to give a link where you can read this. Exactly, yeah. uh, it's the material that Matthew and Luke have in common that is not in Mark. Yeah. So think about that. It's a very logical process. If they followed Mark as their main source, then you have to ask, well, what else did they have? Well, each of them has his own material. Matthew has things like the birth story of Jesus. And Matthew is very different from the birth story in Luke. Luke concentrates more on Mary and her side of the story. Matthew's almost, Matthew's almost exclusively about Joseph and uh, discovering her to be pregnant and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that's just an example. Same thing with the ending. If you read the ending of Matthew, it's very different from Luke. Luke has all kinds of appearances in Jerusalem. Matthew doesn't know anything about that. He tells the disciples in Matthew, uh, or they're told, go up to Galilee and you'll see Jesus, and they do, and so forth. And we've even covered some of that in some of our programs before. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you they have their own material and they have Mark. And then we think they had this source. This is based on Luke. Uh, most scholars believe that Matthew is more edited and redacted, as we say, and we can extract it from Luke. So I got this from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, I'm going to put it on my uh, blog, and yep. anybody can download it and read it. So if we start with the earliest source and ask the question, in the earliest source, how is Jesus presented, especially in terms of being divine or being God or anything of that nature. Yep. And if you've never read the Q source, we call it Q comes from the German word Kvela. So when I say the Q source, I'm saying the source source. So if you've <laughs> never read what the Germans called the Kvela, meaning the source, uh, you're, you're in for a surprise because it's not going to sound like Christian theology at all. It doesn't have the cross doesn't have the death of Jesus, doesn't have anything about the blood of Jesus saving people from sin. How could you have a collection of the earliest sayings of Jesus that don't include some of those Christian fundamentals that people think are just bedrock faith? Apparently, in the earliest collection of the sayings of Jesus, that material doesn't appear. It's secondary. It's later. It's it's based on certain theological developments that begin to take place long after the time of Jesus. So this is our closest look, I think, at the historical Jesus. Now, people argue back and forth in my field. Was there a cue or what was it or did it circulate? Well, I like the way this is. Just, 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 to, just to be fair, some people do say, I'm not saying I agree with them, but some people do say that we don't actually have this cue document. That's right. Doesn't exist. Yeah. It's it's a it's a, a construction by historians uh, who think that this doc. But we don't even. The other thing is we don't know if it was a document or an oral tradition or was it partially. The, the question right. is we don't know. So it, it it it's a hypothesis, but one that I think persuades most scholars that it definitely was an actual source Q used by Luke and Matthew, as you say. Exactly. We, don't, we don't actually have it. This is what I. No, we talking. don't have it. Well, I extracted this literally from. Uh, my computer program of Luke. Uh, I put it together today. So whether it was a separately circulating document or not is somewhat mute because it is a source that Matthew and Luke are both aware of because that's how we get it. The material that Matthew and Luke have in common that is not in Mark. So they're different uh, theories as to how they would have come to both have this material. Did they get it from one another? Was it a separate independent circulating document? But either way, we've got it here.
Yep. Now, if you look at that immediately, and I've just gone through and marked a few things that I want to highlight. Yeah. Um, the very opening, it starts with John the Baptist, as you might uh, expect. Yeah, I can actually see the document, yeah. So if people don't have it with them, they can just link, click, click on the link now. They can get up the document. And they can yeah, they can it get it out and follow along. Uh, yeah. What James is saying now. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, the very first one. And yeah. right away, John is preaching. John the Baptizer, I like to call him. And he talks about, uh, don't say that we have Abraham as our father. And others don't claim the pedigree of the Israelite nation, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. So you see right away, it's what we call theocentric. In other words, not that Jesus could do that. Jesus is ready to come on the scene here. But uh, right away, it's God, the God of Abraham that is highlighted. Mm -hmm. And just as God chose Abraham, God could choose stones if he so wanted and turn them into the chosen people so to speak yeah. so it opens with this radical idea that to to listen to god and to repent of your sins and turn to the creator god is the main thing not a claim of any kind of uh, religion or even pedigree mm. then you get this amazing scene the famous temptation of jesus this is not in Mark. Mark refers to Jesus being tempted by the devil for 40 days, like Moses in the, in the wilderness, 40 days in fasting. But he doesn't talk about what the temptation was. Hmm. Now, again, it's very important that we're, if this was a private, if this was an independently circulating document, you can see the effect of reading it. I start with God and Abraham and God's sovereignty. Just, you know, it's important to see. Then I get to Jesus, and he is tempted by the devil. And the devil says, uh, if you're the son of God, command this stone to be bread. Or if you're the son of God, uh, worship me. And Jesus, in each case, responds in a standard Jewish monotheistic way. For example... He says, uh, when Satan says, worship me, and I'll give you all his power, listen to this. And Jesus answered, it is written, he quotes, you shall worship Yahweh, this is Greek, but I'm putting the Hebrew, the Lord, L-O-R-D, all caps. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Well, this is all the way through the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. I am the Lord, there's none beside me. I am God. There is no other. So here's Jesus in the Q document. We're just, I'm just going to call it the Q document, in the Q source. And what is he doing? He's affirming in the most emphatic way to the tempter, worship only God and him only do you serve. So that's, I mean, how could you have a stronger statement than the one God? And it's right there as you start. That means that anything else we see, for example, if Jesus is called the Son of God, uh, that would have nothing to do with Jesus being God. Adam is called a Son of God in the New Testament. The next gospel, the very, yeah, the very, very same gospel. And, so. and so forth. So, but in the next section, this is chapter 6, it's on page 2, uh, upper part, if you're going to follow along later. Yeah. Jesus is talking about some of his ethics about turning the other cheek and very well-known things people often refer to it as the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew. Yeah. But here's what he says. He says, uh, he's talking about love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. Very important phrase. In other words, notice the plurality. You, if you imitate the ways of God, which are peace and justice and goodness and even offering forgiveness to sinners, if you will do that, who people even that are your enemies, you'll be sons of the Most High. And notice the phrase, the Most High. You don't use the Most High unless you're coming out of this very monotheistic Hebraic view of God right there as, as we open it up. 
Now, he does go on and talk about hearing my words and doing them and so forth. But let me go to page three. I'm, I've just picked a few of these. Uh, yeah. I want you to read it all. Yeah. And this is where John the baptizer has now been arrested. And he wants to know uh, of Jesus. He sends disciples to ask, are you he who is to come or should we look for another? Now that phrase, he who is to come, refers to messianic prophecies in the Hebrew Bible, and he's primarily probably thinking of Isaiah 61. And the reason I think he's thinking of that is Jesus quotes it back to him. Well, if you look at Isaiah 61, it makes it so clear who Jesus thinks he is. It, is, it goes like this, and the Lord, Yahweh, or yod heh vav -Heh, has anointed me by his spirit to preach good news to the poor, to heal the sick, to make the blind see, the lame walk, and so forth. So when John says, are you that one? He sends back word. He says, go tell John what I'm doing. You know, uh, the yep. blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, and the poor have the good news preached to them. But that is the figure you can look it up in Isaiah, Isaiah 61, 1. The, Lord, it's, he's, the figure speaks in the first person. The Lord has anointed me to do these things. Again, it would be absurd to say the Lord has anointed the Lord. You know, yeah. this figure. God here is really a separate person, a separate being. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. From the one who is being anointed, uh, Jesus in this case. But it gets better if you keep reading. And this is why. You know, people, this is in everybody's Bible, but they tend to just, well, don't think about all that because yeah, it could be a problem. Some okay. people do, but most don't, actually. I agree. So most yeah. don't. Chapter 7. This is uh, 24 through 35. It's in the middle of the page. Now, this one just blows you away. After John does his query, are you the one or not, he says, well, let me talk about John for a little bit. And this is the main pericope in, in all the Gospels on John the Baptizer where Jesus gives his view of John. And he talks about he's the messenger of the covenant that God sent. This is Malachi. Uh, depends on the Hebrew or the English, but chapter 3 is usually the chapter in English Bibles. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Now, I believe that the next phrase that often Christians run to when they hear that, because look, look what we're saying here. Among those born of women, if you're born of a woman, you're a human being. I'm sorry. You know, even if you had a view that Jesus had a miraculous uh, birth of some type or a divinely inspired birth, if you're born of a woman, you're flesh and blood, you're a human being. You're not a God. He says, among those born of women, there's none greater than John. And he's standing right there saying that. This is a huge problem. If Jesus thought he were God, would he say, among those born of women, you know, I was born of a woman, Mary's my mother, uh, but John's greater than me, then you'd have another God. Instead of the Trinity, we would need four gods, right? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and John the Baptist, because he's greater than the Son, according to this. Well, it's ridiculous. So, some pious, I think, editor added, yet he who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. Uh, for example, we have a, a document of Matthew in Hebrew, Matthew's version of this same thing. Remember, Matthew and Luke both have these passages. Hmm. And in the Matthew version, it's called Evan Bohan, or Ibn Shaprut was a rabbi who preserved it. It doesn't have that addition. In, and it, it's the Gospel of Matthew that had passed down in more Jewish circles. So this is probably somebody copying in the third, fourth century, and they think, oh, wow, how could Jesus possibly say John was greater than him? Because that's what he said. And, uh, you know, what is this thing about greater? Then he goes, uh, you think he's a prophet? He's more than a prophet. And then Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. And we're going to see that in this document. And that's where people get very confused because they think Son of Man is some divinity idea. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see today that it absolutely is not. In fact, it's the opposite of that.
Yeah. It comes from Daniel 7, verse thir verses 13 and 14. It's written in Aramaic, and it's a vision that Daniel had, the prophet Daniel, and he sees the Most High God, whom he calls the Ancient of Days, on the throne. That's not the Messiah. That's not Jesus. That's not anybody but the one God. And then he sees a bar Enosh, a son of man, a human being, coming before the throne of God. So this is a very unusual event. A human gets to have an audience with God, just like Isaiah. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah sees the throne of God. It doesn't mean he's God. It means he sees the throne of God. Mm -hmm. So this son of man figure is everybody says, oh, that's Jesus. That's the Messiah. He's the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven. You get that phrase uh, in several of the Gospels. Uh, they don't read Daniel 7, where Daniel is wondering, well, who is that son of man? And he waits for the angel to interpret it. And nobody reads the interpretation. Exactly. The interpretation the says... He says to the angel, I don't quite get this. Can you interpret this? Yeah, what, what, what was that son of man? That's and he, he says, tells, him, tells him what is meant. And you're right, that bit where it's actually made explicit really is very clear. Um, and yeah, and what is it? It's the people, notice the phrase, of the most high God are collectively called the Son of Man. Yeah. Jesus then, who take rule at the end of the age of all the kingdoms of the world. That's what Daniel 7 is about. No matter how you understand the kingdoms, they all are destroyed, and the kingdom of God then stands forever. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I'm not sure I understand. I thought I had that muted. I'd had it silenced. Let me just shut it down. Hold on. You'll have to. <laughs> that was Siri interrupting us. Here. That, was, that was quite timely. <laughs> it was. You can leave it in. <laughs> Siri, you don't understand. Keep listening. So Exactly. Okay. So. Think about this. What it's saying is that there will come a time when human beings, son of man is a term used for a human being, meaning there's angelic beings, there's God most high, and then you have this human being before the throne of God, and you go, how could a human being be here? Because humans don't belong before the throne of God. Well, for in a, this is a vision or a dream that Daniel has. And he's told, what does that mean? It means the people of the Most High will someday take over the rule of the earth. And the Most High God will be God. And of course, they're not God. Jesus claims to be a representative of that effective takeover. He's casting out demons. He's healing the sick. He's teaching people to repent of their sins. He's acting like a prophet, very much like a prophet. And uh, so that's very important. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you'll see in here several times it'll say things like, if you reject me, you reject the one who sent me. Well, every prophet said that. If a true prophet comes and speaks the words of God and you reject that prophet, have you rejected the prophet or have you rejected God? But people read that and they say, oh, look, it says if you reject Jesus, then you're rejecting God. It's talking about the message. He says, yeah, the one who, he who hears me and rejects it. And there's the words. Uh, but if he's a true messenger, then obviously you wouldn't reject him either. Um, when he teaches the prayer, the famous Lord's Prayer, it's called. Yep. Yep. What does it start with? Father, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name right away is the one God. It means there's no other name. You're the sacred one, the name of God. Um, a few other lines, the heavenly spot, father gives the spirit. Again, this is very monotheistic throughout. Uh, when he casts out demons, notice what he says. He, does, he never in cue says, I do this, I do that, I'm so great. He said, if I by the finger of God cast out demons, the kingdom has come upon you. Because he did believe that in this document that he's beginning to defeat the powers of Satan by the things that he's doing, calling humans to repent and so forth. Yeah. 
So uh, it's hardly a Christian document the way people think of Christians. Mm -hmm. Then he talks about the Son of Man coming. Well, that's Daniel 7 again. I think the followers of Jesus did believe that he was the Messiah and he would be at the head of the redeemed group that is following the ways of God. But remember, if you follow, you'll be also sons of the Most High. So sons of the Most High, son of man coming the clouds of heaven is the same thing. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's it's Theos. When I went through, uh, I was looking at this this morning because I knew we were going to do this. And every time it had God, I just marked it. And it is so theocentric, it's, there's no doubt. You know, God does this. God clothes the poor. God cares about the sparrows. God, 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 all the way through. It's very, very. But be ready for the coming of the Son of Man. What is the coming of the Son of Man? That judgment that Daniel 7 talks about, where all these kingdoms will be destroyed. So if you... You've got to understand Daniel 7, and then you can understand it all. Let me see if there's anything else. Oh, how about this? No one can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. That's that old Aramaic word meaning wealth or worldly kinds of things. You've got to choose God. This is God, God, God all the way through. Now, it does talk about Jesus being rejected. But what prophet in the Hebrew Bible was not rejected? Uh, John the Baptist was arrested and beheaded by Herod Antipas. Jesus is going to be arrested. And so the idea of being rejected, of course, does not say anything. And then the last phrase is, it, I'll close with, this is page nine, the very last one. You have continued with me in my trials as my father appointed a kingdom for me as the representative of the rule of God, the Messiah, I appoint for you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So uh, apparently in the Q document, the choosing of the 12 was in order for uh, representatives later that would rule over Israel uh, in this document. And that's it. Uh, there's really nothing particularly Christian here other than it's Jesus speaking. Um, some of the apocalyptic urgency does seem peculiar to the document. You know, if I, by the finger of God, cast out demons, the kingdom of God has come upon you. But uh, the end didn't come. And uh, those who did interpret Jesus as thinking it would come in his own day, uh, turn, turn out to be wrong. We've talked a lot about that over the years, this apocalypticism. So I would uh, there rest my case that if you go to the early, earliest source in the Gospels, yeah. it's strictly monotheistic, and not just reflecting it, but actually denying anything else, particularly the one I started with, you shall worship, Yod Hey Vav Hey, the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. No Trinity, no possibility of bitheism. Uh, can I just say, is is there not? I'm just looking for it now. Or maybe I, I uh, maybe I'm wrong. The, the so-called Johannine bolt from the blue. Oh yeah, yeah. I didn't uh, mention that. Yeah, uh, which is uh, the reason it's, it's called that. It's not my phrase. It's, it's found in many scholars. Um, yeah, uh, Boltman, Boltman named it that. It's chapter it? twelve. 8 through 10. I'll read it. Ah, thank you. Uh, I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will acknowledge before the angels of God, but he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Everyone who speaks a word... No, is that... No, that's not it. I'm sorry. I, so, I think but, it's 10, 10, 20, 10, 21. Yeah, 10, yeah, I read the wrong one. I marked both of them. Let me, yeah. So you have to edit that out. Um, yeah, so he rejoices. Yeah, I've got it. Yeah, 1021. Yeah. What you're referring to, Paul, is 1021 through 22. Yeah. I think Boltman, Rudolf Boltman, the great New Testament scholar, first called it 
the Johannine bolt from the blue. Like you're reading a long, yeah. earliest document of gospel material, and suddenly it sounds like the Gospel of John. Yeah. Okay, I'll read it to you. It says, all things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, or, the, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And this is binatarian theme. It's, it's very Johannine, like the Gospel of John, where you have the Son and the Father co constantly in, in, in contrast. And sometimes uh, Jesus talks a lot about himself as the Son in yes. John, but uncharacter very uncharacteristic. In yeah, and it's probably, remember, the way we get Q is we come up with a formal definition. Now, as you could program a computer print out the material that Matthew and Luke have in common that yeah. is not in Mark, and it would spit out this document if we ask it to do the Luke version. Yeah. So that would be there. It doesn't mean, however, that everything here was part of the Q document, because think about it. If Matthew and Luke independently had anything that tended to be the same, and there are other places where they do, then it would show up as Q. So it's not as though we've recovered a copy of that scroll, you know, the sayings of Jesus. Yeah. So I would tend, because it goes so far against the flow of this material as a whole, uh, for example, no one knows the Father but the Son. He just said John the baptizer is the greatest prophet of the time, and among those born of women, there's none greater. So that would be a conflict right there. So, you know, uh, it's there, but probably was not necessarily part of the original cue. Okay, thanks. And there are a couple of other examples like that. So then I wanted to go to Mark, and uh, just to do, you know, we're not going to do the whole Gospel of Mark, but I would like to do two particular passages, and we, we could spend the whole time on Mark, but I want to get to Paul as well. Okay. And... Let's look at Mark 10, first of all, and you people can just find this. I printed it out, but yeah. um, people can just find this in their Bibles. Okay. Uh, Mark 10, 17. Aha, uh -huh. one of my favorite verses. Yes. <laughs> my favorite in the, uh, in the oh, that's right. And here is Jesus. Now, this is Mark, our earliest narrative. Mm -hmm. And Matthew and Luke sort of include this, and we'll talk about that because they're not very happy with Mark's version. As he was setting out on his journeys, Jesus, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, you would expect, why wouldn't he say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, or repent and be baptized in the name of Christ, or some kind of Christian answer. I mean, if you ask, how do you have eternal life? And what does he do? Well, first of all, he says to the guy, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. And the word alone is very important because that's part of that Shema. The Lord our God, the Lord alone, or the Lord is one. There are various ways to translate the Hebrew. But I, I think God alone is very effective because it means no partners, basically. Why are you calling me good? There's only one good, the creator God, alone. So and that, and that, and that emphasis that you made is very Islamic. Uh, you often hear this uh, very point that you made, reiterated constantly in the Quran. This is a very Quranic theme, Surah 112, for example, as well as found in the Gospel of Mark, funnily enough. There it is, there it is. And, I mean, pious Jews quote it three times a week. Three times a day. Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. And uh, literally it can be the Lord alone, like only the Lord is God. L-O-R-D is an unfortunate translation because it gets confused with the Lord Jesus. So then he tells him to keep the commandments, which you would expect. How, how do you have eternal life? You repent of your sins. I mean, and how do you have eternal life? You repent of your sins and begin to live a life according to the ways of God. This is very standard uh, Hebrew Bible teaching all the way through the Torah, the prophets, the writings, and Jesus is reflecting this as a good Jew of his time. 
He then uh, tells the man, if you want to follow me, though, then you should give because the man's very wealthy. I didn't mm -hmm. mention that. He yeah. says uh, you should sell what you have and give to the poor. Now, whether he's got to sell every single thing or not uh, is not the point, but he wants to make it clear to the man that you can't just claim a sort of self-righteousness. Like, well, mm -hmm. I do follow God. I'm a good Jew. I do everything right. If the poor are outside your door eating the crumbs from the table, so to speak, another yeah. gospel story. And the man says, well, that's going a little too far. Now, I turn to this mainly for the rebuke. Matthew is very unsatisfied with that rebuke. Remember, Matthew is following Mark. He's rewriting Mark. And he comes to chapter 10, what we call chapter 10, verse 17. And he goes, whoa, if I leave that in, Jesus told someone not to even call him good because only God alone is good. Wow. So what does he do? He says, why are you asking me about the good? Well, first of all, he, he didn't ask him about the good. He called him. And anyway, good. he's a Messiah. Why, why, he why just, he just takes out the rebuke entirely. Yeah. Luke does leave it in. Uh, that's because I, I think Luke is not a, he's not much of a Trinitarian guy. When you begin to look at Luke, he tends to go with uh, Paul, the uh, particularly the early Paul. So mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I want to mention that one. And then yep. the other one that yeah. is just in Mark, and I'm not, we're not claiming to do all of Mark here, no. but the other one is at the end. That was sort of the middle. Okay. And this is even more important because here a man, a scribe in the temple in Jerusalem, um, asked Jesus, which command is the first of all? Ah, right. According to the rabbis, there's 613 oh. commands. Not in the Torah, if you start with Genesis 1, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and you count every command, yeah. about two-thirds of them have to do with the priests and the temple, but a lot of them do have to do with behavior and conduct, and particularly the ten words of the Ten Commandments. So he says, well, what is the first? And Jesus says, the first is, hear, O Israel, Yahweh, or the Lord, all caps, our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And it's translated all your strength. But in Hebrew, the quote, this is a Greek document. In Hebrew, it actually means with your everything. Right. Singular devotion to the one God, the ever living one, Yod, He, Vav, He, the one who is and will be and always was. Mm -hmm. So that's just, I mean, you know, here's Jesus of Nazareth being asked, what's the main thing? And then he says, and the second is, love your neighbor as yourself. But it doesn't stop there. Then the guy, it's like he's listening. He's a good guy. By the way, Matthew takes this out entirely. He can't stand to have this guy commended uh, because he's a scribe, probably a Pharisee. But he's clearly a spiritually minded Pharisee because he looks around the temple. You picture him kind of waving his hand and going, you're right. If you love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself, you've got all of true religion right there. That's it. There's nothing else. So we wouldn't even need all of this temple and all these things that we're doing. And Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Isn't that it's the most amazing thing in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. What he's essentially saying is true religion is to worship and serve the one God, the creator God, and to treat others as you would like to be treated, to put it in the golden rule form, yeah. or what is hateful to you, do not to others. And there's half a dozen ways you can say this, but essentially love your fellow human being. As you love yourself. When I, uh, it's, it's a curious thing, and I didn't expect this. When I ask Christians very often, what was the greatest commandment, the first commandment that Jesus gave? And nearly always they say, love your neighbor as yourself, which is curious because that's not actually the answer Jesus gave. The first commandment is, believe in the oneness of God without partners. 
the second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. Yes. Um, and it's interesting how they, that is usually ignored. And I, I'm still not 100% sure why it is ignored, uh, but almost as if the first commandment is sort of uninteresting or no longer particularly relevant. But but it is theologically extremely important because it's the oneness of God. Here is where the Lord our God is ehad, or in Arabic, ahad is a very word the Quran uses in. That's Surah, right. Yeah, Surah. right out of the right out of the Hebrew. The Quran yeah. is actually affirming the Shema ehad, which is actually, as you say, mentioned by Jesus in Mark chapter twelve, verse twenty-eight onwards. I think that may be why it's not really emphasised because it's a little bit embarrassing because it's not Trinitarian. Jesus, is not the second person of the Trinity, in this passage. Yeah, it wouldn't make sense for him to say that. And the thing, and there are many other places, uh, it's not as though the entire Gospels got rewritten in a Trinitarian form. I wanted to mention uh, Kermit Zarley's book. Oh, yes. It's called, uh, I've got it here, the exact title. The restitution of... Yeah, Restitution, and then it says, Biblical Proof Jesus is Not God. Mm. And uh, it's a, almost a 600-page book, and I've got to get my screen back here. Hold on a second. Because this, this book in its first edition has been out for some time, but is, is there a new edition now? It's okay. a new edition. It's on Amazon. Right. Uh, Kermit Zarley. He's a professional golfer. He's retired now. He's a, he's, a, he's a Christian believer, but he does not believe Jesus is God, and he is very strong about that. And, you know, there are many other places we could go. So when you go, he goes through the entire New Testament, every passage that people turn to and quote, and he shows how this is act, what I'm highlighting just by going through these early sources, the Q source and Mark, trying to show that in those sources, this is what you have. Oh, one other in Mark I need to mention all right. When Jesus in chapter two heals a paralyzed man, the enemies of Jesus who are very critical of him, they say, well, who? But he does say to the man, your sins are forgiven. And they say, well, who can forgive sins but God? He's claiming to be God. And then Jesus answers and he says, but that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins, you know, and then he heals the guy. So no matter how you take that passage as a whole, it's clear that Jesus is saying he's been given the authority. And you do find, for example, in Genesis, Abraham prays for one of the Egyptian kings that he'll be forgiven for his sin. You know, he says, pray for me and so forth. Uh, this idea of interceding for somebody. But clearly, uh, we should mention that because often it's taken as, and as their question, who can forgive sins but God, is no one. However, God could delegate in a certain situation uh, a person who's actually physically impaired, he's paralyzed, uh, a certain uh, a healing that could come to that person. That's at least the drift of the story yeah and of course in matthew in his in his usage of that passage has the has the crowds in awe of what happened and praising god who has given such authority to human Absolutely. beings Absolutely, matthew wants to make sure you don't get that wrong right? as Jews get it and and, and the, 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 this is the final comment of that passage so matthew is clearly what with with that sentiment uh that god has given human beings a sentiment so instead of actually being an argument of Jesus being god is actually yeah. an opposite it's, it's actually the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, Zarley's book goes through all of these. Others have done this. Uh, there are quite a few important books on Christology. The mm -hmm. reason I really recommend Kermit Zarley's book, well, first of all, it's almost 600 pages. It's so thorough. But he also is writing for believing Christians. Right. And he wants them to realize that they have created an idol out of Jesus, and that this is a huge era, uh, a kind of fatal flaw, uh, and that it actually goes against what the earliest followers uh, believed, and that's what we're covering today. Jesus. So then we're, then we're left with Paul. Yeah. And uh, Paul, we're going to uh, stay with our earliest sources. 
I can wave my book on Paul around a little. Just, just to reiterate, I'm, I'm sure most people know that Paul is uh, is actually our earliest source for Christian beliefs about Jesus, not the Gospels, which were written uh, some years later. So the earliest workings, the works in the New Testament, are the authentic writings of Paul. Um, yes. And this is a book that I published yep. a few yep. years ago, Paul and Jesus. Uh, Paul, yep. you, Paul, and I have done whole programs on this. Yep. Yep. But it also. I do, I do, recommend it. do you recommend that, folks, if you want a good introduction to this whole subject of Paul and Jesus? So, um, one of the things uh, we can't do all of Paul, but let me just say Paul makes it very clear in passages like. Um, 1 Corinthians 8, this is a letter he wrote. Remember, these are Greeks, and he's taught them about the one God. Mm. In his earliest letter, I'll back up a little, 1 Thessalonians, he says that they have turned from idols to serve the living God and to wait for his son, the Messiah, from heaven. Mm -hmm. Okay, so notice, yeah. very standard expression you turn from idols to the living god but this is interesting in first corinthians 8 he's paul is talking about uh going to these temples and maybe eating some of the sacrificial flesh that was offered to these deities and he has a kind of uh he doesn't think he should go into the temple and partake of it but some of this was sold in the marketplace so what he's concerned with is to let people know, whatever their decision is, are you going to buy this meat that was sacrificed in the temple of Athena that morning, and now it's just being sold as meat? Uh, some would say, well, it doesn't the meat's not hurt. You know, it's nothing. It's not tainted with idolatry. Others would be more conservative and say, I don't want to support that in any way. So what does he say? He says, this is verse 4 of chapter 8. As to eating food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there's no God but one. He's quoting what we just went through in Q and in Mark. Sir, I mean, this is absolutely, they're singing the same stanza of the same song, mm. and there's no God but one. No. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, Indeed, there are many gods and many lords. Look at Caesar. Look at all the gods and lords of all the Greeks and Romans. But for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. Okay, that's, that's what you would say about the creator. And then he says, and one master, Jesus, the Messiah, through whom are all things meaning the movement, you know, that we're part of this messianic movement. It's through him that they, Paul, believed they were called into this uh, faith. But very clearly he's, you know, there's one God and one master. And the master is the one who's pointing to the one God, as we've already seen. But the passage that gets quoted the most, and uh, we, we can't do them all, but we'll do, you know, everything in Paul but we'll do Philippians, which we think is one of the early letters of Paul. Mm -hmm. And it's chapter two. And many scholars have argued that it's a pre-Pauline Christological hymn mm -hmm. exalting Jesus as God. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it could seem like that when you read it in English without a context, like we just read what Paul says, there's one God, God alone and one master, the Lord. But what happens with the English word Lord? People get very confused because L-O-R-D, all caps in the King James and most standard translations, the new RSV that you have, the RSV that I use in the Hebrew Bible, that is the divine name. Okay, that's the yod heh vav -Hey, the ever-living one. Yep. Uh, but if you say the Lord Jesus, you hear people all the time. I grew up in Christianity, and people would say, well, you know, I hope the Lord blesses us today, or, you know, the Lord's been good to us this year. And yeah. you, you want, are they talking about Jesus? Are they talking about God? It's not clear. 
And often they're not clear. If you listen to prayers, they will start out always to God, the Father, our Father in heaven, da, da, da. And then they'll say, but you died for our sins, and you get, and you go, whoa, 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 here. <laughs> that's called patro-passionism. Yeah, that's like Father died for the sins of the world. Mm -hmm. But see, people, it's because of that word Lord. If we'll just quit saying Lord and say master mm -hmm. or rabbi or teacher, then there's no problem. The guy comes up to Jesus and Mark, we just read it, good teacher, good teacher. It's not good God, good teacher. It's rabbi. It means, uh, you know, kurios in, in Greek. is, is right. that. Did you know a, a wife, out of respect, could call her husband kurios, and it doesn't mean, Lord, yeah. you know, like I'm going to beat you yeah. down into the ground. It was Abraham that's in, in Genesis as well. Exactly. And also, he would call her uh, lady, uh, we can't say mistress because it's been ruined in English, but you Brits have this right, Lord and ladies. You know, the Lord of the mansion, the lady of the mansion. They have different roles, but both titles are highly honorific. None of them have to do anything with God. It's just yeah. who's in charge? Who's in charge of the kitchen? Who's in charge of the household? Who's in charge of the farm? Who's in charge of the manor? You know, this goes back in all of our cultures. Yeah. So, so part of it is that problem, that word Lord. So this is Philippians 2. Philippian, Philippi was a town in Greece, and Paul had raised up a church and preached there, and now he's writing them back. And he's trying to get them to behave in a unselfish, humble way. And he says, count others better than yourselves. Nobody ever reads the context of this. Count others better than yourselves. And don't look only to your own interests, but the interests of others. That's the context of what I'm now going to read. Mm -hmm. Have this mind among you. And there's this attitude of counting others better than yourselves. That was also the mind of Jesus, who though he was in the, I'll, first I'll read it just in English. And this is where people misunderstand. And then we'll explain what I think it means in Greek and Really, even in English, you can see it. Yeah. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Messiah or master to the glory of God the Father. It's very similar to the forgive sins. Who can forgive sins but God? And then as you quoted, Matthew said, amazing, he's given authority to someone on earth to forgive sins. Okay, but if you read it that way, you can see how someone would say, um, well, look, he was in heaven with God. He was equal with God. He was God. He gave it all up, called incarnation. And then he died on a cross. And then God said, come on back up, sit at my right hand. I'll give you everything that you once had and more. And that's how people read it. it it's sort of this uh, in heaven, on earth, back in heaven again. Mm. However, if you look at the language, who, you have to ask yourself, because Paul is very familiar with Scripture, with the Hebrew Bible. Who was it in the Hebrew Bible, and I'm not going to, uh, let's just see if people can listen and tell. Who was it in a story in the Hebrew Bible that wanted to grasp and be equal with God, and they disobeyed God and tried to grab that equality rather than listening to God and obeying God? Yeah. And many people would remember the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. So what happens in that story? The Satan, uh, he's actually called the Nakash, the, the shining one, the deceiver. He says to Eve, and eventually Adam shares in this, in the story, uh, you, you, you want to be equal to God? Uh, then you need to eat this fruit that you've been told not to eat. 
because God knows if you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like Elohim. You'll be like God's. And so what Paul is saying is the fundamental mistake of humans was to God wants to reward humans with heavenly glory. Mm. But if, and even for them to be Elohim in a certain way, you know, powers, uh, forces in the universe, because Elohim can mean, you know, various things. It can be used for judges and people in authority and so forth. So what he's saying is, uh, look at what Adam did. Adam, let's call him Adam 1, Genesis 2 and 3. What did Adam 2 do? Because Jesus calls, I mean, uh, excuse me, because Paul refers to Jesus as a second Adam, meaning a human who did it right. So what is it when a human does it right? A human doesn't say, I'm going to be equal with God. Therefore, I will disobey God and I will become like God. That was the message of the Nakash. (coughs) So he's saying Jesus didn't do that. He emptied himself took on the life of a servant, washing feet, serving others, giving up what he had for others, a life of sacrifice. And because he did that and it becomes an example, he was then exalted as the Messiah. Paul believes he's been highly exalted. But why is he highly exalted? So that people will then give glory to God. So it's not about... Adam 1 and Adam 2 becoming divine beings, like Adam 1 wanted to go to heaven and be God, Adam 2 uh, wants to go to heaven and be God, or anything of that nature. But it's rather, have this mind in you that you put the interests of others first, and Jesus was willing to do that, according to Paul, even to the point of death. So what people are missing is Genesis 1.26. Though he's in the form of God, Genesis one twenty six. Let us make yeah, he was made in the image of God. He he made, but he's, he's not God. He's a flesh and blood human being of the dust, and he's going to go back to the dust. So, but in the Adam story in Genesis, he goes, "Oh, so I could have eternal life and be God. I'm going to go for that. I'll grab it." Mm-hmm. And this is Paul is here saying this is Paul, whether you go with Paul or not. Let's get what he says is Jesus didn't do that. He didn't choose that path. He chose the path of service, even the point of giving his life for others. And therefore, God has exalted him to the glory of the father. Now, this thing about the name of Jesus bowing and so forth, that is Paul. Mm. Uh, I think it is a problem. It would have been a real problem for James or any of the early followers. This is Paul. And he does tend to believe, not just tend to believe, he does believe that Jesus now has been exalted to the right hand of God. He sits with God in heaven and has all power and authority and so forth. And whether that is the view of James, let's say, who was the leader of the Jewish followers of and the, and the actual brother of Jesus, by the way, the actual brother of Jesus. some other guy in the early church. He was when the actual Jesus, brother of Jesus. Yeah, there is an account. It's a clouded account. It's from Hegesippus. It's uh, uh, he's a third yeah. century Jewish believer in Jesus. But he is asked. Uh, I'm sorry. There is an account from Hegesippus. He's a third century believer Eusebius. from a Jewish background. Eusebius yeah. quotes him. And according to him, when James was killed or stoned to death by the same priest that killed Jesus, that uh, they asked him, well, what about your brother? Everybody's following your brother. Do you believe in him? And what he says is, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. He actually quotes Daniel 7. Now, I don't know how accurate that is. It's coming through a couple hundred years of, you know, transmission. But if you think about what he said, he seems to be, I could take it as, don't ask me about my brother. He died. I'm now going to die. But you know what counts is the son of man in Daniel 7, the people of the most high God 
are going to finally triumph. Right, right. And that's how I read it. Not like, you'll see my brother coming in the clouds of heaven. Because yeah. Jesus was also asked that when he was on trial. And he said to Pontius Pilate in Mark 14, 62, you'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. And as you're going to see Rome overthrown by the powers of God. That's what he's basically saying. Yeah. Indeed. <clears throat> so I think if we take these three sources, start with Paul, we'll work backwards. He does seem to be 50 CE. And then we go to the earliest collection of the sayings of Jesus and the first narrative account of the life of Jesus. The monotheism is very, very clear. And, uh, you know, basically... The Messiah is not God. God anoints the Messiah. Mm. And that's very clear. Uh, words like God has chosen him, anointed him, exalted him, given him a name, and so forth. God is always the one. So uh, there's no Trinitarianism, and there's no bytheism. No. In I, early I, sources. Indeed, and also little, little details at the beginning of Mark, I think it is, and Luke as well, where you know, Jesus portrayed just going off, you know, before dawn just to pray. Um, and, you know, he's, he's a humble Jew who's going to pray to his God. And these little details you t tell us a lot, obviously, about his spirituality, his dependence on God, his need to supplicate and submit to God. Uh, this is not consistent with a being who was himself God, who wouldn't be going off in the very early hours of the morning to pray. You know, it's, it's, so, to pray. <laughs> it's so, if you can back off from it and immerse yourself in yeah. particularly the Hebrew Bible at this time is what they had, it actually becomes such a ludicrous idea that it's hard to even put it into words. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, if somebody said, well, the Messiah, he's God, right? He created the world. It would be like, what are you even talking about? It would be like me saying that, well, this mouse, you know, runs my household, right? Uh, it's, it's, we call it a category mistake because it has nothing to do with reality. The Messiah is the anointed of God. The Lord God has anointed me as mm. Messiah, you see. Mm. And you know what, Paul, you know this, but some of our listeners or viewers might not know this. Even in the text that people think is the most uh, Christocentric, as they call it, John 17. We've got Jesus himself. I thought of this because you mentioned him prayer, praying. Mm -hmm. And he's praying to his God. Yeah. And what does he say? I'm praying that they will know you, the only true God. This yeah, is Jesus and John saying, yeah. you, the only true God, and Jesus, the Messiah, who you sent. That's a perfect Christology of early Christianity. Yeah, Jesus the father, the God. If it was Jesus Trinitarian, he'd say, not you were the only, you, you were the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But yeah. no, the word only there really limits God deity to, to the Father, as it's called itself. So by I'm the way, saying. I mentioned um we've talked about this before, Hebrew Matthew, George Howard's book. Oh, yeah. In the uh Great Commission, as it's called, right at the end where uh, he says, go baptize and teach in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let me read it. This is a Hebrew version of, uh, and it's not Jew, it's not like, oh, well, the rabbis took that out. It, it's not a rabbinic edition. This is a Hebrew copy that circulated in rabbinic sources. And so they go up to the Galilee and it's, this is Matthew 28, verse 16. They came to the galley, and he appeared to them in the mountain where they prayed. And they saw him, and it's translated worshipped him, but in Hebrew it's just, you know, they, they bowed. And, and, but some of them doubted. And Jesus said, to me has been given all power in heaven and on earth. Go teach them. Notice, he doesn't even mention and baptize them in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that most scholars would argue that that Trinitarian formula that, that rings so crazy when you read it. There's no way Matthew, the original Matthew, even in Greek, much less Hebrew, wrote, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is the formula used forever and ever after. 
So it's not even in this manuscript of Matthew. In origin, a church father quotes this, and he indicates that it's not in his copy as well. So, you know, Bart Ehrman has written about this, the orthodox corruption of scripture. Uh, I highly recommend that book. There's a very academic edition, yep. the orthodox corruption of scripture. And then there's one called Jesus Interrupted, meaning Jesus is talking and we interrupt him and add our stuff. This would be Jesus Interrupted. Like, didn't you say something about baptism and the Trinitarian formula? Well, you're interrupting Jesus. Let him talk. Mm -hmm. So they're brilliant books. But what he shows is that 90% of the things put in were to push this Trinitarian view mm -hmm. of uh, Jesus as God. So the scribes are going back through doctoring up the manuscripts. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, what I have found, and I think Bart Ehrman would agree with this, the scribes are really kind of dumb mm -hmm. when they interpolate. I'll give an example, uh, Josephus, you know, it's interpolated, the thing about Jesus. At that time, there arose a man. Yeah. If it be lawful to call him a man, it's like they're, they're, they're just – they're so naive coming from that time and place. They think they can just put stuff in and no one will notice. They'll think, hey, Josephus said Jesus was more than a man. Yeah. And, and actually, my students can do this exercise. I take that passage about Jesus and Josephus Antiquities, book 18, and I give them and I say, cross out the things that you think are unlikely that he would have said and see if you have a coherent testimony left. And it reads perfectly fine, like a guy came and he worked miracles and preached and taught. Mm -hmm. And uh, so interpolators tend to be, they, they tend to add things tacked on yeah. and they stick out, as we say, like a sore thumb, like, what? Where did yeah. that you, you, you mentioned a book there by Professor Bart Ehrman, The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture is the effect of uh, uh, early Christological controversies on the text of the Bible. I think that's the, actually the subtitle of it. Yes. And there's actually a, a lot of evidence that, that the New Testament manuscripts were tampered uh, with, and not just by the Orthodox, meaning what became to be normative Christianity, Catholic Christianity, or, or um, but also by those who, are, uh, who, who had disagreements with that. Some Arians uh, had a go as well. But so it was a battleground. But certainly we, we, are, we are now aware, because we have many of the manuscripts, of the way the scriptures were altered and changed by many, many people. And you mentioned some examples, but not just the scriptures, Josephus, uh, in in his he's a first century Jewish historian who mentions Jesus. His work was tampered with uh, by later Christian scribes as well to make Jesus, as you say, to, to appear to be like a, a supernatural divine being. I a bit like the Christian Jesus. Actually. That's right. Yeah. Um, uh, so um, it's interesting how unscrupulous some, at least some Christian scribes were. They weren't above tampering with their own Bibles to heighten, embellish to exalt, uh, to conform the scriptures more closely with their later Christian uh, theology. And, and this is not a conspiracy theory. This is, we, we know, uh, Bart Ehrman has presented the evidence exhaustively in a very scholarly way in this book, The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture. Yes. It's yes. written by a scholar for Scott. I've read it, and it's not really for the general public at all. <laughs> it's, it really is written. Yeah, Jesus Interrupted is more popular, easier to read. Is popular. The other one is straight from the, uh, the hip as a scholar, two other scholars. Although you can read it, it is readable. But uh, no, you're right. Jesus Interrupted is the one that distills that for a much more accessible audience. So right. it is a quite a scandal, actually. How yeah, I, I've also shown, uh, you can go to my blog, jamestabor.com, and just type in the search, uh, the original uh, Book of Revelation. Just type in Book of Revelation, you'll get it. Because what I've done is um, taken out the interpolations in the Book of Revelation. These are not textual. These are just, you'll see immediately when if you look at what I created. Mm -hmm. They're all, all, all the references in the visionary material. Now, that's not the beginning and the opening. That's clearly Christian overlay. But once you get to the visionary material, <coughs> there's no Jesus at all. What it will do, the, I'll give you an example. The kingdoms of the Lord have, I'm, I'm sorry, the king, he'll edit that. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God. Hmm. Okay. And then, yep. and of his Christ. And, and 
that's one where it doesn't say Jesus, but other times they actually put in the word Jesus. And so there are about uh, two dozen of these. If you take out all of them, and I do this for you, I can show you the document. It reads perfectly well. It's not even a Christian document. It's a form of Jewish apocalyptic thinking developed uh, as an interpretation of the book of Daniel, uh, written in late Roman times, you know, in the late first century under probably Domitian and Nero. So it actually wasn't Christian initially. And it, it's just so amazing how you literally can just, each time it's tacked on at the end. So these interpolators, uh, and we don't have a copy that preserves the original, but if you read it, you'll see it. It's so yeah. obvious. You'd see it immediately. And so uh, they, they, have, uh, they have a kind of a heavy hand, we call it, you know, meaning whenever they write, you go like, oh, that doesn't look like the original uh, would have read like that. They, they put too much in. Mm. Um, there are other examples. I'm just going off the subject. We won't go into it. But, uh, but Erman has also written about forgeries. And these are whole letters in the New Testament, which are yes. some of which are almost universally thought to be forged uh, by virtually everyone. For example, the second letter of Peter, which oh. actually claims to be by Peter, actually says in the text uh, that you know Peter is the author, but is now seen by virtually everyone as a second century forger. Yes. And, and the, the Harper uh, Collins Study Bible revised, uh, this is just one example. A very good, very good uh, addition to get. Yeah, I mean, it, it says, you know, the letter was written in the mid-second century. Obviously, it, it could not have been written by Peter. And the reasons why, in the letter itself, it's very clear, it could not have been written by the That's right. Yeah. who was the, uh, you know, the, the prince. So of we're learning, yeah, we're learning a lot. And it's important to, uh, you know, I'm a historian of ideas, uh, you know, ancient Mediterranean religions. And part of what I do is, is, is I, I want to stay the scholar here. As you're tracing the history of ideas, it's important to see how they move through time mm -hmm. and how you start with this and then this gets added or this gets taken away and then it evolves into this and this and this and this. Mm -hmm. and that's important if you looked at any kind of thought, like I recently did a series on YouTube that was very popular called Ideas of Death and Afterlife in the Ancient Western World. Okay, so people misunderstand. They go, oh, Tabor's talking about his, his view of that. No, I, my views are my views. I generally keep them to myself. Yeah, you do, can, you do kind of interviews. So I, you know what you think, but, well, I guess. But, but, but I want to present, if you ask me what did Paul say, I'm going to tell you what Paul said, and I'll give it with some enthusiasm because, you know, I wrote, wrote a book on Paul and devoted a lot of my life to studying him. Mm. But uh, what you have to do is realize that what we're trying to do as historians of religion is to describe what would be called the history of ideas down through time. Mm. And that is so important because you have to ask, how did we get where we are and what are the assumptions that we make about religion? For example, when you die, your soul goes to heaven and you meet Christ and you get judged and put in heaven or hell. Well, that is an idea that eventually develops and most people kind of carry it around in their heads. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was not the early, that wasn't what Jesus said would happen at the judgment. Sorry. Uh, I, I, I'm not trying to cater to you as a Muslim, but if you read Matthew 25, what Jesus says about the judgment is basically all the nations get gathered. There you go. And they're judged according to how they treated oh, other people. That's right. And nothing said about, uh, did you get my blood? Did you, were you baptized? Or, and this is in Matthew 25. Mm -hmm. And there are Christians now developing. They still have their ideas, their doctrines. They go to church and so forth but they call themselves Matthew 25 Christians. I've seen this in magazines. Like oh, 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 oh. And what they're saying is, look, all this doctrine, all these things that develop, uh, they're trying to kind of cut to the chase. What really counts is, is how you behave. You know, uh, and did you know the book of Revelation is really amazing, chapter 20. It's the only picture of the judgment of all humankind. And you know what it says? They're judged according to what they had done, their deeds. And Paul also says that, that God will judge every person according to his deeds, what they've done. So, you know, 
a lot of the things that people have in their heads weren't originally the ideas that you find in some of these early texts. So, I mean, it's very true. But certain kinds of evangelicalism, you know, if you just believe in Jesus, that's it. You've got your, your guaranteed passport to heaven, and uh, you basically sit back and <laughs> that's it. It's completely yeah. unbelievable. And good, you know, we don't want to caricature good Christians who would understand that's not the way and do demand the ethical kind of behavior. But still, on a popular level, lots of people see it as what we would call fire insurance, literally. You know, uh, insurance. you need to take out a policy. And then you have Pascal's wager, which has always amused me, oh, yeah. because that would be the idea. Why don't you just go ahead and believe it anyway, just in case it's right. true? Yeah, yeah. And I always say to students and people who bring this up, like, wouldn't it be better, Dr. Tabor, just to go ahead and believe it? Because if it isn't true, you know, we'll all be dead. And if it is true, I said, yeah, but what if there's a special judgment for those who are very dishonest with the evidence? You know, that that's one of the things. In other words, you did this only for the free ride you thought you were going to get. So guess what? It doesn't work that way. Yeah, yeah, the moral exactly. universe does not operate by... Mm -hmm making bets on what would be the safest for your soul. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, this is a very good, very good response. Uh, well, th thank you very much indeed. Okay. Uh, uh. Dr. Tay before this, and I said before, um, uh, there's a whole bunch of links, um, including the, uh, the Q, uh, document, which gives you that incredibly early source of, uh, Jesus teaching, um, along with Mark and, and, uh, so that that's worth just getting uh, used to the theology of it. It's very theocentric rather than Christocentric. Uh, and, and also how the, how the other early sources are really not Trinitarian. We mentioned Paul, of course, and other passages in Mark, which clearly suggests a quite a different understanding of the concept of God, which is not Trinitarian yeah. at all, but very Jewish, actually. God alone, you know, you, uh, a had rather than a plurality of beings or persons in God, which is, not really there at all in the Shema, in the Jewish understanding, let alone the Islamic understanding, which is the same as the Shema, actually. So, um, okay, yep. well, thank you, Paul. Thank and you I, very much. Yeah. Uh, as always, fantastic. Until next time. Okay, take care. Take care.